Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, presented by AT&T 5G. I am Andrew Wiebe with my partners in soccer, four-man crew on this Thursday. We need all the bodies we can. It is expansion draft eve. Tom Bogert is here. We had to pack the roster so that we have more people that we can protect. Or not exactly. Protect. You know, Tom's yeah. a homegrown under the age of 25. Maybe still? No? no. We, uh, no, no, 27. no. Okay. So you're available for selection, Tom. <laughs> David Goss is here, obviously. Charlie Davies. This is the Thursday crew. We have officially transitioned to the MLS offseason. How does it feel, guys? Charlie, you feel good about it? We got that you know, bird's eye view of Gareth Bale scoring the game tying goal, made the big difference in MLS Cup. We've recovered. Daylight Savings has probably killed you just as it's killed me but we're fathers i don't know if anybody knew that uh charlie off season how you feel i feel great i'm i'm so hyped for the future world cup <laughs> next season <laughs> let's go it's a I'm, big, I'm not just a huge just, future no guy to rest right now like let's go Can I, I will just, i need, I will, I need t- a lot more energy from all three of you i will so tell you know. people if from the based off the meeting we just had like playoffs it's cream of the crop, right? You're Play getting off. to the point where like, there you go. Where like every, you know, every game's high intensity. It's the best players in the league. I think you, at least the two, Weeby and Charlie, Tom, I won't say the same for you, are struggling to reassess or reset. And I'm, we're saying names on expansion draft and you guys are like, that guy's terrible, blah, blah. And it's like, you got to readjust and understand we're back into the like, we're talking, could Chicago Fire make the playoffs combo? We're not talking LAFC Philly. Who's talking, right who's talking about Chicago Fire making the playoffs? That's the type <laughs> of players that, we're talking about, here, Charlie. Didn't I have know. to take that shot of Malort this year. I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> Can I just say the biggest shock of this very early offseason is that after MLS Cup, it wasn't Charlie Davies that went to Disney World. It was David Goss. Oh, I love yes. Disney. That was <laughs> magical place went in the to world. Disney World. That We will get to the soccer. We'll get to so much more, obviously. Uh, We will encourage you to listen to Jesse Marsh's 1v1 with me on the podcast feed, as well as our USMNT roster reaction show. But, Dave, explain to me why you've taken on Charlie Davies' duties in the offseason. Yeah, someone has to, you know? And I just felt like there was an absence of extra time representation at Disney World. And I thought, if no one's walking 22 miles on cement with kids crying everywhere and paying extra money, for average food and drink, what are we doing? So someone had to go down, carry the mantle. Uh, for, unfortunately, fortunately, Hurricane Nicole came. I hope everyone in Florida is doing okay and up the coast and whatever. Uh, so we got in a minivan and drove 10 hours, 12 hours, just to get out. Seven people in one minivan. David Goss sitting in the back seat, legs Ooh, cramped that in. Sounds, that Seven that people sounds you... Sounds like the Poca Poca. Right. Seven people you know. <laughs> I'm assuming these these are people you my know. My in-laws. Oh, okay. My in-laws. So yeah. My, Even better, worse. Whatever. My two nieces, <laughs> my parent-in-laws, and and my sister-in-law. Plus now my wife. I obviously shaved off eight and a half minutes in my shift of driving because, like Vin Diesel, baby, I live life a quarter mile at the time. But you know, I got to say, on this morning, it was a good a good drive for you. You made your you made your time. But we need a moment of silence here in the pod. We're here for you in your moment of need, Dave. Junior Urso and Orlando City have parted ways. Left on a high, baby. Started a final. Led them to a trophy. Make Always leave making them wanting more. And that's what Junior Urso did. Like Gareth Bale, came in as a big-time signing, succeeded over the course of the season, and then took his flowers and left. To my beloved Orlando City community, thank you very much for each and every minute you allowed me to represent Charlie you knows. for the last three years said junior i did everything in my power to make you feel well represented on the field and i hope i made you proud it hurts to say goodbye i didn't want it to be this way but it's time to take care of my family know that i love you and i'm going to miss you i will be rooting for you day in and day out you will never hunt alone what an emotional what an emotional goodbye Uh, it's poetry poetry all right let's jump into uh some of the moves around major league soccer we have uh st louis sporting director Lutz Fine and still coming up here in a little bit with us. We'll talk expansion draft, DPs, roster construction, everything going on with St. Louis City. The expansion draft is on Friday, 7 p.m. Eastern. It is going to stream on the St. Louis City SC YouTube, MLS's YouTube, MLS Twitter, MLS Twitch. I'm going to host the thing. Kalen Carr will be with me in St. Louis. 
We'll have Lutz, uh, and then we'll have, oh. I think, Bradley Carnell as well. I was going to be there, but actually, I'll be at Disney World. Wow. No, you're not. <laughs> yeah. Will you actually? Are you really? Yes. Stop. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. what, a, what, what a reveal. A, what an absurd Christmas, person. Disney World. Beautiful. Disney not, World's on the Christmas. This is Disney not, World's on the Hallmark Channel. Thanksgiving. What are we talking about? No, Disney World's on the Hallmark Channel schedule, which is November 1st. It's Christmas. Sorry. Oh, I'm there God. December 18th. To the twenty third. So That's what does that month, have to do? Charlie, what's it to do with the expansion draft? The expansion draft's Friday. I was thinking of the super draft. Oh, okay, oh. that's also insane. My Lewis, fault. Which I will host that one. Still well. recovering we'll, from LA. Uh, we'll talk CCL draw on Bryn Olsen as well. All right, let's get into it. This morning, Stephen Goff reporting, and then it became official. I believe I'm looking for the uh, yes, press release. the Galaxy yeah. sent up. Yeah, uh, Derek Williams traded from the Galaxy to DC United for 180k oh. in GAM in 2024. Future GAM, Charlie. I know you love great the deal for Galaxy. So, um, yeah, but before 2021, when the Galaxy signed him, DC had his MLS rights, the discovery rights. They traded those to the Galaxy for 125k in GAM. So there's a little tip for tat here. Um, DC is going to re-sign Williams to a two plus one, two years, and then plus an option. 44 matches for LA for the uh, former Blackburn Rover, who's also played for the Irish Listen, national team in the past. If you're a DC fan, this trade is so much better than the Brad Smith trade last year that it's just step by step you're slowly improving. It's concerning to me that this is in 2024, Gam. Have they leveraged all of their allocation money this year yet? Or is there <laughs> an arcane? It's like That's pretty concerning because they had a really big summer transfer window with a lot of players that didn't look so great over the second half of the season. I know that they were trying to fit it all together and rebuild under Wayne Rooney, but I think that that could be an, an interesting detail. I think it's just a concerning move in, in general. <laughs> if, if this was DC United last year or the year before or the year before and they're struggling and – it's kind of expected with Wayne Rooney. You're supposed to be going in a new direction with, with a lot of, of hope. There's nothing that has, that I've seen from Derek Williams that is, is going to give me belief and hope that he's going to shore up this back line and, and, and prevent DC from leaking goals. So that's, that would be my concern. If I, if I'm a DC United supporter saying, Hey, I thought we were trying to get infinitely better and, and taking those right steps and, this is not a, a signing that is is assuring to me if it's more concerning than assuring if if I'm a DC United supporter. Yeah, look, there were times this year, Charlie, that I'll agree with you that Derek Williams didn't uh, – he, he wasn't at the in the upper echelon, let's say, of MLS center backs. But Wayne Rooney gets a left-footed center back, could also play left back. You partner him with Birnbaum. There's a new deal in place. So he was on 750K last year for the Galaxy. At that cap hit, I completely agree. You'd be like, wait a second, no chance. But if the cap hit's a little better and Rooney can get more or more consistency out of him, isn't you, Steve you, Burnbaum wait, you your expect, left sided center back? You expect them to be starting? I like, don't know. I, is is those that, are, those, that your those would be the though? two. I don't know. Those would be the I two on the roster. I right wouldn't now. say in the last two years, Derek Williams has shown he's a better player than Donovan Pines. And Donovan Pines is already on the team, and he's not a starting center back right now in MLS. So I don't see the improvement from Fine. this move. When I tweeted it, I said that DC did the Galaxy a favor. Yes, and they did. Tom, Tom it Facts. sounds like from your reporting, um, that favor may, may, depending on how free agency goes, uh, come to fruition in a pretty special way for LA. Yeah, uh, my assumption, just based on talking to people, is that the LA Galaxy would be one of the teams very strongly in the market for Aaron Long as a free agent. Um, free agency doesn't open for another six days, so there's nothing that, that can be happening right now. Long is obviously about to be at the World Cup, so I'm not expecting a lot of traction going. I'm sure that there will be conversations with this camp for whatever teams are interested in him, but I'm not expecting a whole lot to be moving over the next few weeks because he'll be focused on the World Cup. But yeah, I, I was kind of hearing for a while that man the galaxy makes sense he's a california kid you know lafc was a name just thrown around like a while ago just because of, hey like california they could use a center back obviously lafc are pretty sound but galaxy could use an, uh, an upgrade at center back and trading away Derek williams opens up a lot of cap space it depends on i guess how much more room they'd be able to free up and what teams are allowed to kind of offer aaron long whether he's going to be capped at at some sort of raise or not so there's a lot to figure out it's super fluid so i just want to caution caution all of that to say that these are teams i expect to be interested and there's a long way to go uh breaking news uh, is it breaking news i guess it happened uh it ooh, happened hour two ago. hours ago yeah nick yeah. cushing his interim tag has been removed 
So he will coach next season uh, for NYCFC. That makes sense given the progress they made at the end of the year. The start was a little bit bumpy, but we've seen before in New York. That's happened to other managers. Dome, uh, certainly sort of the, the test case for that, and they've come out well on the other side. Ronnie Dyla to Nick Cushing, a uh, decent run in the playoffs, didn't quite get where they wanted to go, but some turnover, and now they run it back on the managerial was, side it, for next it, year. It was interesting over the course of the playoffs, Campione's Cup, I was with him a lot. Sort of him say, explaining how he had to find himself, even though he was part of the staff, and that was like a really interesting process for him of like, he was the one who helped put together Ronnie Dyla's tactics and ideas and the way the team played. But then as head coach, I think the issue was as injuries and different things happened, how you react to them away from the plan was sort of where he was trying to be Dyla. Then he found himself and for NYCFC, this is huge to start next year, not having a coach try and figure that stuff out. Right. You assume this is a supporter shield contender because they ended last year at that quality. And now they are able to start the year uh, at that stage. All right. More moves. Some guy named Tom Bogert reported per sources that Nashville SC Ooh. have acquired winger Fafa Pico from the Houston Dynamo. 100K GAM plus incentives. Fafa's 31, 18 goals, 8 assists, and 61 appearances in Houston. Would have seemed like a Ben Olsen type of guy to me, but it uh, seems like they've been trying to move him on for a while now. And this is like Correct. Nashville SC in a nutshell. They were looking for more uh, more look goal-scoring punch literally anywhere outside of Hani Mukhtar. And uh, Fafa Pico is a guy that works hard on both sides of the ball and can put the ball in the back of the net, can get hot and be that guy, Tom. Yeah, so his dynamism is something that attracted uh, the club to him. They tried to trade for him on deadline day in the summer, didn't quite get a deal done. There was a lot of rumors about Fafa leaving the Dynamo because he was unhappy. He wasn't playing a ton. So I think that it's kind of a good clean break. Uh, Houston gets some more salary cap open, some more, I guess, assets to move under Ben Olsen and make some changes to that team. Uh, Nashville buy low on a guy who could be helpful. But again, I think he turns 32 at some point during the beginning of next year. So I think this is a really smart move kind of by all parties. 31 or 32. We can debate that at a later date. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting move in that he sort of plays as a winger. They don't use wingers. So is he a wing back for them? Is he a second forward? He's a great pressing forward. And they yes. play him in Hani, which would be false nine ish, but probably doesn't matter for them. Well, and get, it helps them. I think they can play a, a little bit of a higher line then. So I think that they that those two players would work together up top, but I think that this discussion is completely moot because Gary Smith has never played anything other than what he believes to be a target forward next to Hani yeah. Mukhtar. Ake Loba never played with Mukhtar without like CJ Sapong being on the field and they were chasing a goal. Like this, this is just kind of what Gary Smith has done. I think that they can play together. I just they they've shown no interest in trying that. Uh, Nashville, by the way, also doing what they normally do which is print money, allocation money, via international spots. $725,000 in 2023 GAM, plus a second-round pick in the 2023 MLS Super Draft presented by Adidas for four international spots this week. They got two hundred k in GAM from St. Louis City SC. By the way, St. Louis SC also got another international spot from Montreal for 100 We'll ask Lutz about that in a little bit because I got to imagine there's some expansion draft, like invisible handshaking going on. That's just my guess. No sources like Tom. Just a guess. Uh, they had 175K in GAM and that second round pick from the Fire for international spot, 175K in GAM from Dallas, and 175K GAM from the Vancouver Whitecaps. Just money, allocation, money machine, go burr for them. Uh, Charlie, here's one for you. Nico Cantor reporting there are three Premier League clubs interested in Austin's Sebastian Driussi, one of which is Leeds United. Obviously, he was an absolute baller this year, almost MVP, certainly best 11, 25 goals for Austin. He is sort of the shining light of that project. Does this ring true to you? Do you think we could see Driussi actually leave MLS? Absolutely. And you know why? When you look at Miguel Elmiron at Newcastle and knowing that you know there was a lot of hype, him going to Newcastle, and I think in the Premier League, no one really knew too much about Miguel Elmiron. He struggled quite a bit. But this year after taking off and really getting hot, seeing how these young uh, players who, who come over from MLS, whether they're Americans or major league soccer products can have success in that league. Yes. I, I, I would be shocked if more teams didn't come over and say, Hey, we can get them maybe for a little bit more of a discounted price as opposed to buying some of the top talent across Europe at major league soccer. And Driussi has proved proved in, in the league that he has those qualities to be successful overseas. So I love it. And I, I'm sure if you're looking at other teams that possibly have an interest, Everton, West Ham, Leicester City, Aston Villa, Leeds, Crystal Palace. I mean, 
you have Patrick Vieira, who knows the league very well with New York City FC. You have uh, Frank Lampard coaching Everton and Ashley Cole on, on his staff. So there's a, a number of people within the English Premier League that have MLS experience and know players can make the transition that the quality is actually high and value players who do well uh, in Major League Soccer considering all of the the, the tough uh, components of the league. So I'm, I'm not so shocked at all. He, he's a quality player. I would be surprised if it was Leeds, just from a qual- like a style point of view. Uh, that seems like an odd connection to me with what Drew's he does well. But if he's coming from MLS, it, you assume still the numbers selling out of MLS are lower than other quote-unquote Champions League players, right? Because he was at Zenit, which is sort of in that ra- range. Okay, fine. It's just talent to find talent. And like Charlie said, I, I'm not surprised he could – People think he could play at that level. I wouldn't be surprised if he did well. Leeds just seems like it would be a weird one to me. Well, well, so you don't think he has any similar qualities to like a Rodrigo? Like it, it, Leeds have a number of players who fit that mold of what Drusi brings. And I think yeah, he just is better than some of those players. Yeah, he just put up 21 goals in the highest possession team in Major League Soccer. So it's those are two extremes. And I would assume it'd be tougher to say that I'm going to bring this player and put him in this system than finding a player who already plays in a similar system. And it wasn't like Drew UC put up off the chart pressing numbers for them and stuff. So yeah, he's not a passer, which fits as well. He is a finisher. He will get on the end of things that that could make sense, but uh, you know, uh, they know better than I do. So there's that. The illustrious <laughs> folks at Transfer Tavern are confirming hey, Empire, this rumor. HIT says uh, leading the race to sign a beautiful 25 goal striker. Tom, <laughs> uh, what strikes you when you hear this rumor? Uh, I was going to ask Charlie if you're Austin, how much are you asking for? How much are you holding out for? He signed a, a what was described as a multi year deal at, in the summer of 2021. So I'm sure he's under contract for at least another 18 months, if not 24. So what would you be holding out for and asking? For Drew UC? Yeah. Uh, 12 to 15 million. I agree. I could, they, they, I believe that they had to compensate Zenit for his contract buyout. There was a rumor floating around that was like seven million or something. Like I don't know if that's confirmed, or I don't know if anybody can do quick research on that. But um, yeah, so they they would absolutely need to get double figures, which is which is great business. If yeah. you can turn that into a uh, twelve to fifteen million dollar uh, um, transfer fee, that's phenomenal. From from Austin, and it, then you have to go out and reinvest yeah, it. it it's, that's the hard somebody. part. It's great business on like the balance sheet. Is it great right. business in terms of taking the next step forward as a club after you've ignited all this interest? If you if you find the only way that happens is if they find someone to replace him first, because you can't sell him and then say, "All right, guys, let's go out and find a replacement. Let's go find the next Drusi." That's not going to work. You have to have already targeted a player you feel you can bring in to replace a Drew C and maybe already start that contract negotiation so that, you know, it's a seamless uh, transition. Once that happens, I don't think the report can... at the time, by the way, from yeah, Jeff Carlisle was the 7 million. Okay. Plus yeah, 50,000 in allocation to enter Miami for discovery, right? Whoa, whoa. So you gotta, whoa, you gotta recruit Miami. that as well. I don't think there is such a thing as a easy transition or a seamless transition from Sebastian Drew C in Austin. I would guess That's that we get business. a press. I get it, but I I would guess that we get a press release in uh, a couple months, maybe even sooner, that says Sebastian Driussi has soon signed a new long term deal. There he is with Austin Smart. FC. Open your third eye. There you just, go, Weeby. Just throwing that out there. Just throwing that out <laughs> with there. a buyout clause. <laughs> <laughs> I would also say there's a difference, different player stage of career. I think guys that went to Europe and then come to MLS, their lifestyle and thought process agree, is guys. different than I need that shot. For players agree. who want that shot, they want that shot. Okay, that's that's sort of the career arc you see. I think he went to Zenit, played in Champions League, didn't go well. If he's comfortable and happy in Austin, there there's a very good chance that's the lifestyle he wants, and it's worked out well for everyone. Yeah, he's probably just like, let me get let me get up to thirty with that contract, folks. Like I'd like to I'd like to hit the three zero. Uh, he turns twenty seven in February, so maybe even thirty one. Why not thirty two with an option? <laughs> come on, guys, come to the negotiation table. By the way, uh, we're going to have a uh, Lutz Fan and Steel here in just a little bit. But there's more news. Seattle Sounders traded an international spot to St. Louis City SC for another 100000 in GAM. So uh, we have more to ask him about as far as these bargain international spots. All right, a little aside for that Seattle talk there, but uh, perhaps some panic in Austin. Sebastian Driussi 
going to the Premier League. Say it ain't so. Uh, but we know one player going to the Bundesliga. That is Paxton Aronson. Tom, take it away. Yeah, your, vic- pa- your, your victory lap. <laughs> days after. I mean, MLS Cup stole your thunder, I got to say. Yeah, that was uh, they were everybody was trying really hard to keep that news under wraps until after this has been in the works for a while. I had heard the first rumblings of this of a Bundesliga team in the summer. They were trying to kind of get it. They were interested in getting it done around then. It would have been for the winter regardless. So they weren't like pressed on the deadline or anything. But yeah, uh, Eintracht Frankfurt has been a big uh, fan of Pax and Aronson's for a while. Um, they're super impressed by him. The deal is around four million up front with add-ons that I don't know the number for the add-ons, but I was told it, was, it could be a very, very good number. And I was also told the sell-on percentage is, is very big. So it's a really good deal for Philly, for a player who was blocked by an MVP candidate, like no fault of his own, why he couldn't get on the field. It was one of the best teams in the league. Um, and yeah, Red Bull Salzburg were interested. There were some other teams interested. Obviously, he was he won the golden ball, the golden boot at the U-20 CONCACAF Champions, Championship. Like he's, you know, a well-known commodity in Europe. And, you know, Frankfurt acted fast to get him now and they want they want him in the first team there won't be a loan back they, they don't they don't plan on loaning him anywhere else after january they want him to kind of get acclimated in the first team go off to the u20 world cup and then kind of come back next next european season kind of ready to challenge for minutes uh what fourth in the bundesliga right now just beat hoffenheim i want to say yesterday maybe mario Goza, uh, yeah. one of the guys that maybe he he'll learn under in that team uh, do you have an understanding about how he might fit why is it that frankfurt really liked him so much yeah, good, uh, good one. Good point there. I was about to go there with Goza. They play with two number 10s, and that's where Paxson would fit in. So that was another reason that they were kind of bet all parties were excited about this potential move, that there is more ways to get him minutes in this team, and it should be a good fit both stylistically and with the pieces around. Like you said, there's, there's Mario Goza there. I don't know. He won't be there forever. Like th- There's always injury issues with, with him and, and the Bundesliga. They do a really good job of kind of rotating players. This was good. We've seen kind of Americans go to other clubs in Germany that I don't necessarily need to name that you know, don't have a great record for getting them on the field or prioritizing them or being a, the best spot for them to develop. I think that Frankfurt is a really good spot for him. And again, you look at Philly's track record, what they did with Brendan Aronson, they, they sold him to Salzburg when they probably could have gotten a little bit more money out of out of a different club. But Salzburg was the perfect fit. They get that sell on down the road with that big move to Leeds. Uh, Mark McKenzie, the move to Gank, like if he kind of struggled like he did at the beginning at Gank, for like a Bundesliga club, like say Pep, Ricardo Pepe did, he would have been buried on the bench. McKenzie got to kind of play through that because he went to the right space. So I think that we need to give Philly the blind benefit of the doubt in some of these outgoing transfers. What do you think, Charlie? What's on uh, What's on deck here for Paxton? It's good that he's going to get a little time playing mm-hmm. the U20 World Cup. It's good that he's in a, a team that, um, that plays to his strengths potentially and, and opens a door for playing time. What's he need to be focused on, do you think? And what's he going to experience in the Bundesliga? Well, we... We all saw an MLS Cup final. He he wasn't ready. And it's a difficult ask for a young player uh, who hasn't gotten that much playing time because of, of Daniel Gazdag in particular uh, to come in in that situation and deliver. And I think he was a little overwhelmed, one, but what we saw from him was a lack of strength on the ball and and just those reactions, the, the thought process in defending throw-ins, which led to the, the equalizing goal for for LAFC and Gareth Bale. So I think what's going to happen for Gareth, uh, for uh, Pax Aronson when he goes over is just the level of competition is it is going to allow him to grow. And you're just going to see it every single day, the competition, but also the extra training and then the focus on the weight room, the strength, strengthening and, and getting an idea of how to use his body, which Brent Aronson is, is still working on, but I think he's gotten much better and improved and being able to take right difficult, different players. But I think they both had frail frames coming into professional uh, soccer. So I think for, for him, it's that adjustment period. It's going to be hard. It's, it is going to be difficult for him, but he, over that time, I think the, the U 20 world cup comes at a great uh, time for him to go back into playing with kids, his age and, and playing on the world stage. So he comes back into that preseason full preseason and knowing exactly what it takes. He's going to have to learn the language. He's going to have to learn how to, to, to eat properly every single day, no family to help you out. Uh, unless his, his parents travel with him uh, or his to help grandparents him based off the world cup videos with Brendan Aaron. Yes. <laughs> but, but it's, it's, it's another. It's a whole nother world that he's going into, and it, there's a lot of demand um, outside of of the training and the preparation and the playing. I'm sure he'll put, be playing with the reserves a lot, uh, but just that adjustment, getting used to the humor of, of 
the German kids coming through the academy. Um, Germans so, known for their humor. Yeah, noted, I, notably, I, I think he's got a, a tall, a tall task in front of him, but. I think he's ready for it. And he also has his brother to rely on and talk to about how he's been able to navigate those, those um, same uh, difficulties and challenges. All right. Jesper Lindstrom also playing next to Goza, a really good young Danish player, 22 years old, sort of in that same positional spot, but a guy that Frankfurt uh, bought from Bromby, I think, and developed five, six goals in the Bundesliga the last two years. Frankfurt, a good team in the Bundesliga, a good move here for, uh, for our guy Paxton. But, you know, it's incredible. It's a whole new world, as you said, Charlie. Like, Paxton Aronson didn't really play, didn't really impact the first team much, and here he is being sold for $4 million, uh to a team challenge. The league has come a long the top way. Of the Bundesliga, no doubt about that. Let's keep it in league here, Tom. A lot of rumbling about Eric Williamson after he wasn't in some Timbers squads at the end of the year, and uh, it seems like Williamson would – seems like he would like to move. Seems like the Timbers would not like him to move, but they may not have a big choice on that one. Tell me what you know about that one, what the price might be, what potential suitors are out there. I saw Doyle tweeting uh, that the Revs would like to get him to play with Polster and Heel. What's going on? Yeah, I think you you did some good nutshelling there. That that that's pretty much it. That you know, there's he was it was a weird choice for him to be a DNP coach's decision on decision day. Particularly, there was no David, uh, there's no Chara. So um, Eric Williamson, it, it was even stranger that he didn't get off the bench that he didn't start um yeah there's there's a lot of interest for him around the league um portland aren't sh- actively shopping him every time i talk to people in portland they're like we we want him here we want to plan around him like we we you know there have been conversations and everything but from everything i'm hearing from around the league and elsewhere is that one they they expect the price to be around 1.5 million to 2 million gam 2 million gam is the record that um paul Ariola went to dallas last year 1.5 is what Kellen Acosta went to LA or up to 1.5, including incentives is what Acosta went for. Um, Mark see. Anthony K was in the, you know, depending on how you value a super draft pick international side and Ralph Preso, the package was around 2 million. So that's kind of the range there. People around the league are expecting for Eric Williamson. And then I've had a few sources from again, other clubs, not Portland. So don't, don't take this as a hundred percent fact, but the idea is that if, if they get an offer for the 1.5 to 2 million, they were, they were like, we, we would be shocked if they turned it down. So again, Eric Williamson is somebody who, you know, he, he could be ready for a fresh start, uh, maybe a place where he, he wouldn't be a DNP coach's decision on decision day, but uh, this is a fluid situation. There's going to be a lot of teams interested in him and, and we'll see how it goes. Dave, where would you want to go if you were Eric Williamson? Ooh, interesting question. I, I'm probably a little different. I think I'd want to go somewhere, sort of what happened with Jeremy of OVC, where I'm the man and it's built around me. That probably isn't an MLS Cup favorite, right? So the rumors around LAFC are like you replacing Cifuentes, which is an incredible opportunity. And I'm sure Kellen Acosta could speak to the lifestyle difference there. But it's not built around you. And I would like to see a team that's like that. So now you take a little bit of a half step down and you look at, some of the other groups, even a San Jose in that conversation that would potentially do that. Um, one of the in- interesting ones is Minnesota. They- they've had a hole in central midfield. You'd play behind Reynoso and you could kind of just do everything else. And I think Williamson could be really good in a spot like that. Montreal replacing Georgie Mihailovic for them. And they're going to need to replace Wanyama as well. You'd probably be the center of that team immediately, um, which he's never had in his career. Uh, by the way, can I throw one out for you? And I saw you shaking your head, Charlie. Rings culture, right? Right. <laughs> uh, I was going to throw out Nashville. Guess who just generated a butt ton of gam for 2023 yep. off some international spots? And they need guess, to get younger. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Guess who could use that sort of linking midfielder and would truly be building around Williamson in a lot of ways? You talked about Reynoso in front of him. Hani Mukhtar in front of him. That's decent. Charlie, seemed like you had a thought here. I, I don't think he needs to go to a place where he needs to be the man. Um, we saw how well he did alongside Chara um, and Blanco. I, I think he's one of those players that you can get the most out of him when he's not asked to do everything because he has the ability to be an attacking midfielder, to to be a defensive midfielder, to be the guy. But I think that's when he tends to do too much. With With Eric Williamson, he's best when – less is more and less is asked of him where you have some attacking players in front of him. Maybe he doesn't have to just defend and he doesn't just have to attack. He has that freedom, that free role, if you will, to kind of roam the midfield, be a tough tackler, but also play into the final third. So I I look at uh, the revolution is, is a good spot for him because he has Matt Polster who will 
do more of the sitting. And then you have Carlos Hill who do most of the creating and he can kind of go back and forth. That's when he's going to be best. Uh, it's a great shout with, with Minnesota. I think that would be a good spot for him too. Um, Goss and then Nashville. Uh, I think you can't go wrong with any, any of those clubs. Uh, LAFC, if you can go to the, to the champions, why, why the hell wouldn't you? I mean, <laughs> just... I, I, I just don't see Portland saying, here you go, LA, you're, you're our <laughs> conference rival. Get stronger. Let's go. No, I, I, if I'm Portland and I'm letting go of Eric Williamson, he's going to, to the Eastern Conference. Would you An interesting one. Lewis? I don't know if you were going to say that. I wasn't going to say like that. Right yeah, okay. I, I, All right. I'm Show curious to see him in a pressing, more pressing team. I, 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 I'm not saying he can't because he does so many things well, as Charlie talked about. But um, one of the ones that was on my mind is if they don't, Sign Pasuelo or whatever, enter Miami, and you'd have a, that three-man midfield with him, Mota, and Gregory, and whoever else, where it's like they can kind of do everything and young and be able to cover ground in that system. And let's be real for Eric Williamson, like, well, you hey forgot, man, you forgot Busquets there. <laughs> oh, sorry, my bad. My bad. Yeah. Dinsey is one I would like. That'd be so that's uh, that's Wilbodo where he does all the work, Lucho. right? I would love that. Huh. I said that's where if he goes into Miami, he's doing the work for Busquets to get on the ball and and keep possession. So I'll tell you right now, Eric Williamson isn't going to complain about going to Miami or L.A. if that happened to be the case. (laughs) I like Cincy. That'd be a fun shot as well. We'll see where that ends up. Probably a lot of teams need to generate GAM uh, to do that. So you're probably looking at sales or trades Mm -hmm. or otherwise because that 1.5 to 2 doesn't just materialize. Uh, but let's talk about, uh, uh, sounds like it's going to be a transfer record for the Timbers. Tom, take us through what's going on with Evander. Yeah, Timbers have been working on this deal for a while. I reported a couple weeks ago that they were in advanced talks to sign Brazilian attacking midfielder Evander from FC Michelin. Um, that I'm told that the talks have progressed from advanced to uh, the phrases I've heard is all but done. Uh, it would be a club record deal around $10 million is is the best I can kind of come up with. This is a 24-year-old who is currently leading the Europa League right now in assists, um, former Brazil Youth International. He would obviously be a DP. Um, he can play in a couple different positions, but Portland are signing would be signing him to be a number 10. Uh, pretty much just needs final details and medical to be done. So this is this is really, really close, and it looks like Portland are about to get their guy. That's uh, the end of the Sebastian Blanco era as the main creator for the Timbers? Uh, yeah, that- I'm, I mean... The last couple of years, like how many minutes has he played? Like, yeah, I'm, no, I'm not sure that we could even kind of point to that. And again, he's not a DP next year. Um, and Jaroslav Niazgoda can be bought down if he stays. So they could have one more move. But again, this is all fluid. It's going to be a busy winter, or a busy offseason in Portland. Also, how good would Sebastian Blanco be if whatever you get from him is gravy, right? Exactly. Like if there is no pressure on him and it's just come off the bench or be a starter when you're healthy. Um, the line that I heard from someone who, feels pretty comfortable in the Danish league was that at his best, he was better than honey Mukhtar uh, in Scandinavia. But the issue for honey, when he came here and the issue, I think with Evander is it's not that all, it's not all the time that they're <laughs> at their best. So, but if you can get something like right. the honey Mukhtar experience at his age and his profile, I think it's pretty, it could be pretty special, obviously for the Timbers. All right, let's talk inter Miami. They have a bunch of DP spots open. They did sign Phil Neville to a one-year deal. Uh, just stringing old Phil along. He's getting the old Jim Curtin treatment from back in the day. Uh, Leo Campana, that's a DP deal, Tom. Is that correct? Yeah, everything I've heard is that that's the plan. Like, um, I guess I'm I'm trying to not be 100% like binary or black and white with this, but everything I know is that he's almost definitely going to be a young DP just because of where the transfer fee and the contract is going to sit. Um, and so that's one guarantee, one likely DP. Another one would be Alejandro Pozuelo if they bring him back, depending on Rodolfo Pizarro likely leaving get a lot of moving parts ins and out and then that third dp spot is being held open until the summer when one lino messi might be available so we'll oh see. my is God. this a mic come on man like give us something what what are you what do you think put, the, put the, the i'm told the reporting from david ornstein in the athletic saying that miami are increasingly confident is is accurate and kind of one of the lines i was getting was like yeah like we feel as confident and but i'm sure barcelona and psg feel confident and then just take no, a step Barca, back. Barca does not feel confident right Inter now. Miami in the <laughs> same conversation as an MLS club, is the same conversation as PSG in Barcelona for, for Lino Messi. And it's like, yeah, like we feel confident just like PSG does. Like that's, it's crazy. It's like wild to me. From the same club that brought you Matias Pellegrini, Julian Carranza <laughs> traded oh for pennies on the gosh. dollar, Rodolfo Pizarro literally given away. We bring you <laughs> Lionel Messi. So uh, we'll I'm, I'm guessing, Tom, 
for for Miami to get Messi when he is courted still by the, the the biggest clubs in the world, they have to be offering something similar to what they did for for Beckham and Ibrahimovic in, in the case of equity. Is that what you've heard? Is it what what about that deal that is is I guess attractive to to Messi and his camp? What what is it outside of just being in Miami where he has a home, he's familiar with the place, and he'll be getting to play with quote unquote one of his better friends in, in Busquets? Yeah, I mean that like the him having a house in Miami, always vacationing in Miami, all of that is what's attractive. I don't know any details about things past contracts. What I do know is that, again, as, as Ornstein and the Athletic first reported, it's Jorge and Jose Mas that are kind of leading these. Like, I was under the impression that it'd be David Beckham, given the Adidas stuff, given just, hey, he's a superstar, Messi's a superstar, or, like the mutual respect and, and friendship that they have. But I was I was told that, that again, the Athletic reporting was correct, that, like, the Masses are doing a lot here. So in those conversations, maybe there's details like that. I, I think it's it's a fair thing to assume or to ask Charlie, but I just don't have any information on it. I would be, if I'm in Miami and I'm building a new stadium and I want to be one of the biggest clubs in the world and I'm about to have this exploding value of my club based on that facility and uh, and potentially I'm Leo Messi being on my team, I would want Leo Messi to be a part of my team just like David Beckham is forever. I would want, I would want any time Inter-Miami is mentioned for the next thing anybody thought about or said or inserted would to be owned as well by... David Beckham and Leo Messi. Speak it or, into or existence. Fan, fan I, this is what I would personally want. No, no. Leo speak Messi. it into existence. Like, they, they have the, the biggest fan ambassador team that like Blaze Matuidi did when he got bought out and then just went to put on a polo and <laughs> kept that contract for, for fan ambassador. Hey, it looks, it looks good in a polo. All right. It does. We'll see what happens with Inter-Miami. A lot cooking uh, this offseason. Here are some other ones to throw at you, Tom, before we get to Let's Find and Steal. Uh, Orlando. Keep it in Florida. Junior Urso's gone. We didn't take our moment of silence. Perhaps Dave can here while you give us an answer on what's going on with Orlando. Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts. You know, um, there had been reports about Arsenal. Um, his seemed like his agent, I think, was even on the record about that. That he was like, "We have a meeting with Arsenal." Everybody I talked to at Orlando was just like, "We have not been contacted by Arsenal." Like, maybe they're interested, but probably, you know, that a lot of poo pooing on that. I'd, I'd be kind of surprised if, if something happened. But hey, I guess we'll see. Um, they should have a DP spot open. They, they currently do because there are numerous players out of contract, including Mauricio Pereira, Pedro Galese. I was told by multiple sources that the team, things are looking good for both Pereira and Galese. They've, they've made a lot of progress with both players. Uh, so that'd be big to get them both back. And Pereira, if they do get this deal over the line, would not be a DP, which would keep that DP spot open. And they have a ton of salary cap room now with, with Urso leaving. You know, he's going to be really, really difficult to replace both on the field and in the locker room. But he was on a big deal, and so they, they should they should have a couple moves to make this offseason. Matt Hedges, and then we will uh, get to let's find and steal. Yeah, Matt Hedges, and uh, he has a club option for 2023 and 2024, but the club have kind of been in talks with Hedges about a new deal. Progress has not been great there. You know, they are still talking. Um, Dallas protected him in the expansion draft, so that maybe leads to that, that there's maybe some good news. But there are clubs around the league that, that would be interested in Hedges if he does become available. This could be a trade situation, probably more likely a free agent situation. But if he does leave, but again, this is a, a club legend, leads the club in all-time appearances. It's a delicate situation for both sides. Uh, the terms have, like, they've been on good terms in these talks, whether or not they reach an agreement. Like, so I think that's a positive sign for all parties. But I guess that that's one to watch over the next week. They have until November 14th to officially either pick up or decline his contract option. I remember I when he was drafted. I remember interviewing Shellis. He was the replacement for George John. All those years ago. Decent draft pick, Dave. And he's sort of the only like Dallas lifer that exists in a club where a lot of, you know, I, I go to GA Cup every year. He comes out and watches the team. All the kids look up to him. They all know him. That I think all goes in favor of him, but his performance has clearly dropped this year. And for Dallas, I think you could feel somewhat comfortable in saying, okay, can we find someone? They've also brought in a center back as an under 22 signing last year. Uh, and Kosi Tafari I took a step back this year, but I think he's a borderline MLS starter. And they drafted Lucas Bartlett in the first round last year as well. So I think as a club, you're you're negotiating there from a position of power. Uh, but I, I, it would be nice for everyone involved if Matt Hedges retired as an FC Dallas player. 
Agreed. I would agree with that. Uh, it's been fun going around the league. The MLS offseason has officially begun. So much more to come, but Friday's the big day for St. Louis City SC, 7 p.m. Eastern on their uh, YouTube page, as well as MLS's YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, MLSsoccer.com. We will have the expansion draft live for you. Five players taken, maybe some trades. We will see. There are 11 players right now on the St. Louis roster. Two DPs, Edward Lewin and Klaus. Um, we'll see if they're going to add more, what they're going to do. Let's talk to the man who's making the decisions. All right, for more on St. Louis City's expansion draft and 2023 season, we're talking to the man building the roster, the sporting director, Lutz Fun and Steel. Lutz, welcome to Extra Time. I think it's your first time on the show, but uh, we are going to be paying a lot of attention to what you guys are doing under the arch this year. Welcome. Nice to be here. So there is a flood of transactions that we can talk about before we get to the expansion draft. We saw your roster and obviously a lot of internationals in that early roster build. And you said you wanted to get that out of the way before you focused on sort of the domestic side in the winter. But you are picking up international spots at a, a furious pace here. I think it's three so far. One from Montreal, one from uh, from Nashville, one just now from Seattle. Tell us about what you're doing on the international slot side and also just in the trade market in general. Yeah, I mean, as you said, you know, we already uh, had our uh, eight uh, international spots filled uh, uh, six months or seven seven players filled six months before, and we just added the Rasus Alm uh, a few days ago. Uh, having an additional roster slot here or there uh, gives us flexibility, flexibility to be able to be active on the loan market in January. If a bargain comes right now or in the next window, we can be active. If a good foreign player is available right now, in the draft, we can use an international slot. And even more important, uh, you still can sell them back to somebody if you have to. So it's simply a flexibility for us to have and uh, having a few more cards uh, when we play the poker game. All right, you're at the table and I have to, I'm trying to understand this better and maybe you can explain it. Some international spots cost more. You see Nashville getting 175. I think they might've even got 200 from you guys on one of them. And then it's a hundred from Montreal and Seattle. How does that happen in the market? Help us explain what you're working with there. Yeah. I mean, if you're looking into the past, I think, you know, we did a lot of benchmarking what happened in recent years. Um, 200 was a pretty good deal. Um, now getting, getting one for a hundred is a pretty sweet deal. Um, so we do definitely have conversations and then, and, and trying to look into the different rosters, what could be available, what would be protected. So it's for us a game of uh, uh, trying to figure out what we believe, what did happen already, who is protected and who's not. And then that's when we got to the teams and we're discussing a certain option about the international slots. So, um, yeah, it's so far it pan out, but we will figure out on Friday when we come, when you come to visit actually St. Louis, um, how it all worked out in the end of the day. So yeah. uh, we've been 100,000 feet. Sorry, Dave, go ahead. No, you go. Uh, let's get let's get a little bit more broad here. Uh, you had a quote to Tom Bogert: "Starting an expansion team is probably the most difficult job in soccer." Take us big picture, Lutz. How difficult is this, really? Where do you think you stand uh, on this November tenth? I think you need to uh, split that uh, quote into into two halves because uh, um, you know an expansion club like St. Louis, where we started completely from zero. You know, we didn't just uh, start it to build a pro team. We build an academy from scratch. We build a facility from scratch. We build the community system from scratch. So we started literally the white piece of paper. So the amount of work which goes into these three kind of completely different parts of a club uh, needs to be, I would call it, needs to be put in, in perspective also from the time and from the numbers. And now having the opportunity to, to yeah, go to the expansion, to, to bring your coaches and bring your players, well, I was given the unique opportunity to sign a coach a year prior to the first game. I was given the opportunity by our owners to sign seven foreigners six months prior to the game. So the way we can act now at the expansion draft is completely different than most of the other teams did in the past, because usually you pick in the expansion draft and then you get active on the transfer market after. We did it just the other way around. So I do know right now exactly what positions I'm looking for with the five picks. Other teams, they literally had to pick randomly and then build around that. I just built the Christmas tree from the other side. Uh, you mentioned 
those players, but also the coach. Let's talk about Bradley Carnell and sort of what this team will be. We know him from his Red Bull roots. Um, the most successful teams in MLS, so we saw in MLS Cup, was teams that have clear DNAs and identities. What what will your team look like? And then sort of what is the attributes of players you look at around MLS when these expansion draft lists come out and say, this is what fits St. Louis City? Yeah, I think, you know, we need to look a bit into the into the past of Brad as well. So I knew Bradley very well when he played in Germany. Uh, we played against each other and uh, Bradley actually made his coaching license where I was his instructor. I kept on following him when he was coaching in South Africa and he ended up in Red Bull, New York, where, you know, I have a Hoffenheim background. The Red Bull and the Hoffenheim background is very similar with the Rongnick uh, style. So for me, it was I basically made a profile. How do I want the coach to be? And we had hundreds of people applying from all over the world, some of the biggest names. But we had a profile for a coach, and Bradley was the perfect fit for that because he stands for the philosophy, for the playing style, as he said, for the DNA we want to. It is, yeah, you can compare it a little bit to Red Bull if you want to, but we are not Red Bull, we are St. Louis City. So high pressing, counter pressing, high intensity based on transition. But if we do have the ball, we want to do something with it. So we are not really going into this hardcore pressing style where we just literally whack the long ball and trying to get for the second one. If you compare it to European football, I think Hoffenheim under Julian Nauritzmann is that what we're looking for. Be aggressive, be focused on transition, be focused on pressing. But if you have the opportunity to play our game, then we're happy to do so. What kind of player fits that? How would you describe that player? Is there an age range you're looking for? Is there sort of an ability uh, band that you think, okay, these are the things that fit? What, what is that player that you look out into the expansion draft or into the free agent market or whatever it might be and say, yes, that fits St. Louis City? So let's be fair. You have really good questions uh, for a start, I have to say. Um, yeah, I mean, again, we have a profile for the coach. We have a profile for the player. So, yes, we do not necessarily look for 35-year-old former superstars who won two times the Champions League and the World Cup and have been at the top. We want to develop players. We want to have young, hungry players, players where the development is not done yet. They still should be on the way up. Um, so looking at the foreigners so far we signed, I think you see the handwriting there. Um, that guys are far below 30, except maybe Roman Berkey, which is a special position as a goalkeeper with 31, still being pretty young compared to many other MLS goalkeepers. So at the pick, we want aggressive players. We want players who simply fit in the style, which I, I just explained. And then again, we're coming to, the, to that, what we spoke before. There is just some clubs which play so different from the ways we are, so much based on possession, that there is simply no point for us to even look at the players to pick them. When you, when you talk about the big name, name signings, the DPs for you, it's a different profile than what we've seen from other clubs. You mentioned the aging stars, fine, but I think a lot of people feel maybe they're on a, a different level than what we've seen other teams that sort of lean on their DPs and have them carry them. Can you talk us through what the thought process was in those signings and sort of your expectation of how that fits into a full roster? Yeah, I mean, I would answer that question first with a question. Uh, so if you're looking into the past, clubs who really believe that one or two people can carry them through and you're spending a massive part of the budget on it, did that really pan out or work out the way they wanted to? I'm not too convinced about it. I still believe that football is a team sport. The team needs to be the star. The team needs to be the most focused on. And if you load too much responsibility, too much wages, and, and basically all the focus on one, two, or three players, um, it is not good for the chemistry within a team. And I think uh, this is why we decided to have a different strategy I mean, our, our DPs are guys who did cost a bit of a transfer fee, but they are not salary DPs. So they're jumping into DP status because of the whole budget. But it's guys who are 24, 25 years old. And that was done on purpose that way. So I don't really believe in that word designated player. I believe that you need to have good players at a similar level who work together as a unit. And... Uh, if it's called a DP or if it's called a religious DP or a TAM, whatever you call it, in the end of the day, everybody's there to play a role within the team, within the structure. And that is how we build so far the squad. 
Can I just ask you, going into some of the champions and the Shield winners of past years, you look at Los Angeles FC, they have stars upon stars, obviously. New York City, maybe not at that same level, but they're signing big-name players from you know, South America and, or, or prospects and, and coach them up. Or Maxi Morales has been sort of the, the girding of their star power. Columbus Crew had signed Zeller Rayon. Sounders, we know, had stars. And Rui Diaz and Ladero. Atlanta United, that's pretty clear. Toronto FC, even the Timbers. So even on the championship level, there is that element. How special do you think your DPs can be? Because we looked at the Red Bulls this year, and they had the system, but they didn't have sort of the production, the star power. And then how might you think about that third DP spot? What do you need out of the first two that you have? And then how do you think about the third? Yeah, we will not go for a third. Um, I, I don't see that happening. Um, you know, I uh, again, the, the teams you mentioned, you're perfectly right. But uh, uh, I throw another name in there. I give you uh, now Philadelphia Union. That's a good point. And, uh, and then, and then, I, then I, I mean, I was in, I was in LA this weekend, you know, and I mean, I do have a, a very good connection uh, to John Thorrington, um, you know, and I mean, they're doing a great job. But don't forget, St. Louis is not Los Angeles. St. Louis is not New York. Uh, I don't believe that this is what, what, what really helps us to create a starstruck culture. I think we need to come via the Midwestern approach we want to reflect the people who are actually going to the stadium. That's hardworking, that's uh, blue color, that's uh, uh, down to earth, and that's being modest and really get out there, leave your sweat on the field, work as hard as possible, and you will get something done in the end. I believe I want to create young players with St. Louis background, with academy background, who get opportunities. I don't want to close the door just by filling it up with star names. Interesting. So you won't fill that third DP spot. And even if you did, given the roster profile that you have on the first DPs, you would have three U22 spots open. How will you use those U22 spots? Yeah, it depends on what we're going to pick up in the draft. And we obviously still do look at the, at the various markets at the moment. Um, you know, we have, for example, with, with Ostrak, a player, which is an under-23 player. So we do have a certain flexibility now in the squad. However, we, 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 in what category we're putting it in the end, uh, that all depends on now how we're going to, to build the rest of the squad. So we have a certain, we have certain different ways of, of structuring it. Uh, we just have to basically wait a few more days and then make that choice. You, uh, in talking about under 22s, we've seen the heavy influx from South and Central America. For those spots, your background, while you've been literally all over the world, is in Europe. And that's what we've seen so far in your roster build. Is that the angle that you're looking at? Do you have, you feel like connections throughout that part of the world that you're going to start to use for the rest of the roster build? No, well, I mean, you know, I played everywhere. I played in Brazil as well. So uh, uh, normally people usually, when they look into my past, they always connect me to Roberto Firmino, which, which, which we brought to Hoffenheim or Joe Linton. So I do have a very strong connection to South America as well. Um, I just saw by having a brand new team, I think, you know, to put, like going into one direction in the first year to get a clear idea, to also get the players integrated in the right way, makes things uh, a bit easier for us. But we do have, uh, you know, many people would say, well, they have lots of Germans. No, we don't. We have actually one German. <laughs> uh, uh, Klaus is a, is a Brazilian. So uh, we do we do have a, a good mixture. The only thing is that most of these guys played or had their background in the German Bundesliga. But when it comes to football culture, they're from all over the show. So um, it's not like that we're just going in one direction. We are definitely open-minded for, for, for all of that. Um, and uh, yeah, I do, I do really like uh, a team where we have lots of different football cultures coming together. That's a little bit what, you know, what I basically stand for all my career, uh, being, being very international. And uh, yeah. I want to read another quote that you had as we turn to the expansion draft here because we've, re we've referred to it a couple times. Uh, the expansion draft isn't like going into a candy shop and getting just what you want. It's more complex than that. Obviously, the other clubs in the league are stocking the, cam the candy shop. They're telling you these are the guys that you can select from. I went and did the research today as we prepare for Friday uh, just to refresh myself on how previous teams, especially in the last five or six years, have used it. And it's always a mix of players that they hope will contribute to their team but also asset plays. Hey, another club called us. They said, we want Kamal Miller or we want Brandon Vasquez, et cetera. We're going to flip him for allocation money. How closely have you studied previous expansion drafts? How will you balance sort of this idea between players that can affect your team in your colors versus 
the desire to just accumulate assets to build that roster overall? Yeah, we talk now for 15 minutes and I had like six missed calls on my phone. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's like a great timing now to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, you're perfectly right. We did obviously a, a clear research about what happened in the last drafts. Uh, usually you can say two and a half to three players stay. The rest is going to be moved on and you, you actively be on trades. Could that happen? Yes, of course. I mean, uh, uh, I said it, the candy shop, that's the right word. Was it stuffed with candy? Yeah, but I didn't really like that many candies in there that I'm crazy about it and say there is five plays we need to sign. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. It also depends on the communication with the other clubs. Fact is we will pick five players if they will be for us or there will be one or two for other clubs. That simply depends on the communication with the other clubs and obviously also on the deals which offer to us. Will you be more active in the trade market as well? And how will you approach free agency? Because, again, you said the winter is more about MLS players and stocking your roster from those mechanisms. How active do you think you'll be in those two spots? I mean, if you are, if you are patient enough, maybe on Friday when you're actually there, maybe there will be, maybe there will be a I'm trade. I'm not patient, will, Lutz. I'm not. Yeah. I just, it's not me, Maybe man. you will hear a trade already on Friday, right? Live when we're standing on stage, maybe there will be a trade for you as well to announce. Let's wait and see. So, yeah, definitely we do look at the re-entries. You know, I mean, it's 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 a big league. It's lots of clubs. There is lots of players out there which are maybe are protected, but clubs are still shopping them around. So that's when you usually pick something and trade or you trade after. We are in such a, I would call it, comfortable position because we have the spine. Mm -hmm. If you look at, we have a goalkeeper, we have a center back, we have a six, we have a nine, we have two good wingers, we have signed our eight foreigners. So I don't feel that pressure that right now I need to pick that one. Otherwise, we're getting into trouble. You know, we are in a very, very comfortable way now. So I can sit here now and talk to you guys while other clubs call me and I don't answer. <laughs> well, that's what I call, I'm feeling right comfortable right now. But in the end of the day, you know, we can discuss this and that and trades and buys and whatever. Once the season starts next year, we will figure out how good we worked, how well everything fit together. And picking five... If I would pick now the five best players on that list, do you really believe that five players would gel that well together, that it would make us into a great team? No, the players need to fit together. And there is maybe a minimum player, which is a much better fit than a player which is on maybe a young DP in the same position because it needs to fit to our likes, needs, and already what we have signed. So that's why I wouldn't expect necessarily... I think the names you expect will not be on that list on Friday. Assistant coaches for Bradley? I haven't seen any announcements. What uh, what sort of timeline do you feel on that one? We're in the middle of it. So uh, won't be long. I mean, there is a, we wrapped our heads around it. Um, so also something which will happen very, very soon. Uh, Talk, oh, go ahead. You've, you've talked about wanting to build the academy, having those St. Louis players. That's going to take a little time. In the meantime, how do you sort of represent St. Louis in this team? And how do you feel like you've gotten in touch with what St. Louis soccer culture is and, and what you want to present to the world? Yeah, I mean, I had, you know, I had came here on, in August 2020, so I had quite some time now to study everything. I mean, I remember when I came, I was literally every day on every different high school field in the, in the area to try and find the players for the academy. And we did sign players from the middle of nowhere, which are still a very important part of it. Look, um, Yes, uh, it will take some time to get players into the first team. I think we will have a little bit of St. Louis already in the first team with some of our youngsters. Uh, looking at the, the results, so especially the success we had last year in the first time ever competing in the MLS Next, we got to the two nationals, we finished third with the U16s. We had an MLS Next Pro team with lots of youngsters, debut guys from St. Louis. We won the Western Conference and we made it to the final, which we lost against Columbus. So we believe in development. Bradley is a guy who likes to work with young players and make them better. This is why I don't believe in the finished product. We don't really want that. We want to build our own. We want to make the talents better. We want to create. We want to create some players. This is why I also don't feel that 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 pressure of uh, that we have to be straight away next year at a certain position immediately. I think you know. I think we we have a good enough team and a good enough squad that everything is possible but we shouldn't hold ourselves to a certain goal and say we need to make the playoffs, we need to do that. No, 
everything is built on a long term. So is the academy, so is the community. So I think it's always good to look a little bit out of the box and not just what is purely happening next year. I don't um, necessarily define the success of St. Louis City, what we'll do in the first year. Having said that, I'm that ambitious that I believe we, well, I want to I wanna win as much as we can, of course. You know, this is, this is normal. We want to have a winning culture, but we shouldn't feel any pressure. Last one, we'll let you go. I know you got calls. I'm sure no, we're I have another 10, two calls. Yeah, I need yeah to, I need we're to eight to ten, eight to ten missed calls at this point. I thought that was. Uh, tell them you were on with us, Lutz. Everyone loves us. Yeah, yeah, that'll that'll soccer. definitely get you. Now, let me let me re double check. Yeah. So, oh, the uh, the WhatsApp is blowing up too. Probably, yeah. you never know. What right. so? What is you said you've studied, and I'm sure you've studied previous expansion teams, but also just successful teams. And I think the unions are a good example. You know, did we think that guy like Daniel Gazdag was going to be an MVP candidate? No, but he developed into one. What are the keys to being a successful team in MLS under the structure that you're building, the style that you're building, or just generally? And what are markers, not the playoffs, not specific wins, that you would find to represent success in year one? I mean, when it comes to position, if we play around the playoff spot that I would consider as as successful, making it or not making it just by a few points uh, would be something... uh, I would live with, of course, I would take the first option if I can. Um, I don't want to be seen as that expansion team who gets the first year kicked around, you know? Uh, I mean, what, for example, Austin did was for me amazing. They had this this kind of cool start and they dropped into this big valley towards the end of the first year. They came a little bit back and the second year, they just were absolutely flying because they were patient enough. Patient with the coach, patient with the players. Claudio Reyna is a great example. You know, Claudio did a massive job with New York City. He did now an amazing job with Austin. So obviously, I'm looking at the guys who are running expansions. I'm talking to the guys who are running them. And I do get I do get my feelings and I do obviously need to need to figure out what what really goes for us. To get a few players <clears throat> via the next pro or via the, the from our academy into the first team squad, I will consider a big success. And just create a fortress. People coming to St. Louis and hate to play against us, being a little bit scared, seeing the arch, and like that's not the place where I want to be on a Saturday or a Sunday. That also actually I see as success. City Park looks amazing. I can't wait to see it on Friday. The expansion draft, 7 p.m. Eastern, streaming live on uh, St. Louis City SC's YouTube, MLS's YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, uh, MLSsoccer.com. Lutz, thank you so much. We'll let you get to your calls, man. I know you got some trades to work. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. All right. Interesting stuff from uh, Lutz Fon and Steel. There is a different approach, let's say, to maybe some past expansion teams, and he took us through that pretty well there. Uh, I did make a mistake in the total number of players. I blame you, Wikipedia. Twelve players currently. Josh Yarrow, part of that. Uh, I think Expert every teacher will squad. tell you if you're quoting off Wikipedia, you're at fault. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't have outed myself as quoting off of Wikipedia I'll, I'll, there. I'll, I'll take the blame for you, uh, Weeby. I was the one who screenshotted that and tweeted it and then somebody corrected me that josh yarrow wasn't included so then you took my two that's on me technically my i screenshotted it myself off wikipedia so I'll, I'll i'll jump on that grenade you're good to go tom uh okay let's talk expansion draft we got an idea of what uh Lutz might want to take from the candy shop so to speak i went and did the research uh from the last couple of years and and he is obviously correct there's a mixture here you're looking at like probably about 2.5 players you keep and then you're trying to flip the rest he is getting phone calls he said we're probably up to 10 on that interview uh, just alone. I went back and looked at some of the best and the worst expansion drafts just before we hit the right philosophy question here. I want to run you through some of the worst. 2019 Inter-Miami, Ben Sweat they took, 22 games played, then they traded him to Austin for 100K and GAM. If that sounds underwhelming, that was by far their best pick. Alvis Powell cut after a year and four games. Lee Wynn traded back to New England for a fourth-round pick in 50K and GAM after five games. Luis Argudo won game, waived in September, and Brian Meredith never played a game. He was traded to Vancouver Mm. for a fourth-round pick. They got almost nothing. Extremely tough. Close to nothing 
out of that. Cincinnati, I'm coming for you next. 2018, Darren Maddox, 21 games. He lasted a year, scored three goals. That turned out to be pretty good. Didn't they pay him like a new contract too? Yeah, they signed him a thing. lucrative. Yeah, that was a mm-hmm. tough one. I remember Ooh. being there live for that one. Uh, Roland Lamar, that you know, interesting pick. 28 games, one goal, just a year there. Eric Alexander played six games, and he was released during their first season. Hassan and Dom was loaned to USL twice, never played a game for FC Back, MLS. Baby. And then they got an international roster spot for Kai Kamara. So that was something. A masterclass that first year of Ross yeah. of how there's not some, to build a there's roster. Some other, there's some interesting picks that were traded away here. Austin FC had a pretty tough one. Danny Hooson, Jared Stroud, though they just did trade and- him for 100K. Brady Scott, they cut him. Joe Corona, literally, they took him, and then Houston took him back in reentry, which was hilarious. Brady and- Scott, wasn't he taken by Nashville in the Yeah, yeah, Brady Scott is back. He's, he's back, yeah. Brady and and we back with that. Da- Danny Hooson was a free agent. They Correct. used an expansion draft selection on somebody they yeah. could have signed for free and a few then days they, later. They could have had Kamal Miller, but no, they traded him for 275 in game and a first-round super draft pick that turned out Tom, to be that's, Freddie that's not knowing the rules. <laughs> yeah, that's not great. That yeah. wasn't good. Yeah. That wasn't good. Uh, look, and I, Joe Corona, too. Nashville SC might have liked to have Brandon Vasquez, but they took him in 2019 and flipped him for 150K in TAM to FC Cincinnati. Uh, in retrospect, and in retrospect's the key word, that's a tough deal. Uh, theirs was was not great either with Abu Dunladi, eventually returned to Minnesota as a free agent, Jaleel Anibaba. That was a good pick, helped set the culture. Jimmy Madronda just played one game for them. Then they traded Jimmy, who turned into a starter, spot starter for Seattle, along with 225K in GAM for Hendwala Bawana, who's played almost... Not at all, but, but but they picked up Zarek Valentin and traded him to Houston for Joe Willis. So that was a yep. good move. LAFC is uh, one of the best in 2017. I mean, Tyler Miller, a starter. Latif Blessing still there. Celebrated two shields in a cup. Marco Areña, I mean, he was a gap to Adama Diamande. Then they got Laurent Simon for Retia, Retia and Raheem Edwards. And actually, 2021 Charlotte was very good. Just on 875 gay, uh, gam for Tristan Blackman, who you could argue they should have kept. Ismail Tajiri Shradi, but also Anton Walker was a starter, just a more a spot starter, and then McKenzie Gaines played some. So uh, let's get to the nitty gritty. Dave, how would you do this? What's the right philosophy for Lutz? I don't really know. Um, I would say that I think in talking with him and sort of looking at this roster, they are in a decent position where they have, because they spent across and not top down, they do have a ton of positions filled. So for me, I look at this and I think I would avoid internationals for the most part. Uh, you try and take young domestic depth so that you can start to fill in the roster and guys who can play heavy minutes. Also, those players have value in MLS. So let's say one, you don't need them or two things go wrong. You can start to shift them outside and bring other pieces in. So when I look down the list, a lot of the guys I'm looking at are, there's a few domestic young center backs across the league that are options. Uh, and then some pieces that sort of sit on the edge of the roster that I think can give you some versatility. Um so, yeah, that's what I would go with. I wouldn't try and bring in a Danny Hooson because clearly that hasn't worked in the past. And uh, maybe you could convince me there's some D-mids on this list, like a Brian Anungana or a Dax McCarty. I don't know if he would even be willing to come or Quinone that you trust that you'd bring in. But I would not try and push any of the attacking spots and bring in some of those bigger names. Do you try to take Ali Bedoya hostage? Hostage is a strong yeah. but you know, do you try to like, uh, you know, what Brian Chingham or like Sestanovic him? I would take him for on merit. Like, who could be a better kind of first year club captain? I think he still got gas in the tank. He looks phenomenal this year. I mean, you know, there's age questions that are going to be 36. There's injury issues, but that was just kind of the playoffs. He he played 30 games this year, and he played at a really high level. But the thing is with Bedoya, you have to like he's earned it throughout his career that you have to have a talk with him before. Be like, hey, are you on board with this project? Like, you can't take him and then because he could just be like, screw this. Like, I'm I'll not retired, not reporting. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not coming. Like, no matter what you do, which would kind of suck. But again, I, I think that he's earned that in his career to to have that conversation. But for me, like, it wouldn't even be like a Brian Ching play where you're just trying to get allocation money. I would take him and like, 100%. yeah, captain. Yeah, but if they're not going to protect him, that that that's on Philly. I, that's what I agree. And and if I'm Bedoy, I'm the captain, and they're not protecting me, and you're like, oh, you're gonna put me out there. I would take him because you talk about culture building and someone who's gonna actually gonna give you uh production on the field. Yeah, I mean he, he can perform, he can a glue guy and a guy that's kind of that inspirational leader who's seen it all, done it all. That would be if he's on the uh available to pick, you you snap him up. But if I'm looking at the, the guys that are available, you know, young players, Andre Shinashiki is one that mm-hmm. 
could add value to this mm-hmm. team. Um, Derek Etienne Jr., I think, is free agent. He's one. a free agent. Don't take him. Oh, he's a free agent. Yeah. yeah. Then I'm not going to take him. You could um, sign him, but that's a different, different conversation. John Bell uh, with the Revs. Like who the had, a good one. Shown, I'm mad I missed that in my piece. He's he's shown quite a bit, and and I think his potential is there. So, um, But then in, as far as guys who have done it, Bedoya, Dax McCarty, Teal Bunbury, uh, th- these are locker room guys and and players that you expect to get something out of on the on the pitch as well. So um, there there are there's some quality. Uh, typically, you can look down the list and go, ah, I don't know, <laughs> but you know, a Gustavo Bo oh, yeah. is a player that can do something for you if you're looking for a, a, just a goal scorer. Uh, also, can you just flip him? To, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. It sounds like he wants to go back to Argentina. So, could you acquire him for nothing and then flip him for whatever money? It's yeah. Independiente, <laughs> Rossing. I don't Rossing. remember who. Rossing. Yeah, who? What they're willing to give you? One That's my argument for for Patrick percent. Klamala. Plus, there's the he's a, a player who is bought a couple times for $4 million. I don't know if you'd quite get that going back to Europe, but if I'm, if I'm Lutz, I would have immediately been getting on the phone with all of his Bundesliga contacts being like, can I get two and a half million for him? Whatever. Or he's somebody on the less cynical side. He fits the system. He, he's supposed to be a pressing forward. And maybe you play the, hey, like Julian Carranza wasn't in a good situation. Miami blossomed in, in Philly. Hmm. I know that the Red Bulls play a similar, very similar system to what St. Louis are going to play. So it's not exactly the, the greatest analogy, but I think that you kind of roll the dice on a 24-year-old former Polish youth international, someone who was a numerous teams bought him for $4 million and, and see what you can get out of there. Worst case scenario, it's it's just one of five expansion drafts and you could do worse. On Charlie's point on, on John Bell, who I'm a big fan of, I think he's on the short list of like who's not a starting center back that a team that needs one should acquire. Uh, the other names on this list that go there, Amy Mabika as well, basically full-time starter for Inter Miami out of Kentucky. Uh, Derek Cornelius is on this list was on loan in, in Greece, uh, has played really well. And Zach McGraw, all of them are domestic young center backs that in a spot could start for you. And that's a luxury most teams don't have. If it was me, I'd just take all of them and just have a bunch of center backs and trade some of them <laughs> and whatnot. But just a those, team full of center backs. Those are all, yeah. That, was, that is exactly the team that David the would back. Have. Yeah. I need, I just need all the center backs. Like That's yeah. what's truly important to me. I'll throw out Christian McCoon. He was a guy that had trade value last year within MLS. Uh, young Venezuela international. I think uh, you got Jackson a European Reagan. passport too. Yeah, Jackson Reagan could be one, but he would be at the bottom of these lists of of, of like young domestic center backs. For Reagan's me. one of those guys. McGraw, I would say as well. Where I would, I don't love what I saw from them in terms of the system they were successful in, and what St. Louis sounds like they're asking. Like Reagan played on the back foot in a back five with elite players, where the game was in front of him the whole time. But in terms of quality that you're getting out of an expansion draft. A guy who started a CCL final. Is that correct? Did he start? Forgot. Does anyone remember? He was in the beginning of the run. I think, think Yamar was back. Whatever. He started close to that. Is pretty good. Yeah. Uh, Damian Lowe is also available here. Mm-hmm. And he made under 300K last year. So that'd be one to throw out. Alex Mwils on the list. But I think he's... Uh, no. He's... Well, he Kellen Rose ahead of him. But the Bradley, Bradley, Kellen, but the Bradley Carnell connection. Yeah. Charlie. Like... Fits the system perfectly. Yeah, I don't think you'd take him here. You'd just try to maybe trade for him. I think he's a free agent on the option. It depends on if if Nashville is going to pick up his option or not. But the players union put him out on that list. Yeah, I'm still – I would take Marvin Luria over him, Nico Joachini, Kellen Rowe, uh, Pedro Santos, Dio Bunbury, Philip Mayaka, Junior Moreno. You could go down the list. Josh you, are going, to, he, he, yeah. you <laughs> are going down the list. No, all, no, no. All of, all Another guy to throw are... that that mold is Tim Parker. I'm not mm-hmm. like I don't think he's been particularly on. Let's just say his top level uh, for Houston recently. But if you're looking for somebody who understands that system, could be sort of a locker room guy, and that Bradley Carnell will trust and have a long relationship with. He is definitely on that level. So it's a guy like Kyle Duncan, perhaps. Is Kyle Duncan? You're getting he, his he was rights? on loan. The loan, the yeah, loan is expiring, right. so you would just oh, okay. be getting his MLS rights, and you'd have to talk. Pedro to Santos, another guy where he's, yeah, he's a free, free agent, agent. so yeah. you wouldn't be getting him um, either. The two that stuck out to me at, uh, that were that are starters, I think at fullback, wingback is Ronald Matarita and Lucas Estevez. I think both of them have proven their starter level. Matarita quick probably on es- not in their system. Goss, real quick on Estevez, he's his loan expires this winter. Colorado has well, Colorado or St. Louis this pick. summer. And yeah, they, they extended another six months. They still have uh, a purchase option. Buy. I believe the purchase option is somewhere in the in the region of one million. So St. Louis would have to pick him, 
pick up the purchase option and negotiate a contract for a player that they won't even have a training session with. So like, I agree with you. I think he's a super interesting player, but there are a lot of little hurdles there mm-hmm. to kind of get there. Yeah. yeah. The hurdles are important context. And obviously Lutz is doing that research and you're going and putting the, the free agency list next to this available unprotected list. You're going and putting potential trades. You have teams calling you on the as you trade, said, it's, it's complex on the trade side. I think you put Tyler Miller on your list, Tom, that came out mm-hmm. on MLS soccer.com. I would assume Stephen Cleveland's on that list as well. True. Like, those are two guys where if you need a starting goalkeeper in MLS, you're calling St. Louis and saying, this is what we're willing to offer because it's probably cheaper than what you're going to have to give those two teams. I don't understand Minnesota and, and Miller. They gave him a huge deal. I, it feels like Dane St. Clair is not that long-term there, right? Like they're going to sell him. That's their pretty much only ability to sell a player. So uh, I found that interesting, but I wouldn't have two goalkeepers that I think are starters on my team. Uh, so if you're starter money. If yeah. you're uh, a little confused as to why we're not talking about Austin, Atlanta, DC, LAFC, or NYCFC players, it's because they were all taken. Uh, players from those teams were taken by Charlotte, so they are exempt from this expansion draft. It is draft. wild that Charlotte is not exempt. <laughs> that, to me, is a little mind-blowing. I, I think that Charlotte hey, they got to have a eat, They got taken. to eat. Now they're getting eaten, all right? Yeah. That's the way it works. I, I think Shinishiki is the most likely, but they like p- part of being an expansion team, you don't have – like homegrowns are automatically protected. They don't have any, or they have yeah. one, I think. And they have a generation Adidas player, Ben Bender. So they have all these players and only 12 slots. It's like, Shinyashiki, they want to keep. They signed him to a new contract. Like, Guzman Carujo was their best center back until he got hurt, and then Adilson Milanda was signed. Like, these are players that they want, and they have, and, like, not just on the roster, but we want them to be starters that they couldn't protect. So it, it is, like, I think that Charlotte are going to have a player selected. And like you said, guys, I think it's a little cruel that they – that they're that they weren't exempt and if i'm st louis i'm looking at them saying you guys just went through this like why would i not want someone who has the experience and got through the bumps and bruises they Mm -hmm. ended up better than they started like that to me makes a ton of sense 7 p.m eastern on friday the expansion draft live watch to see who st louis picks what trades happen and whether or not your team has somebody selected kayla and i will be in st louis for the mls cup expansion draft world cup it just just keeps going up sickos unite uh, all right, before we get out of here, any thoughts on the uh, CONCACAF Champions League draw? The first legs um, of these two-legged series start at the beginning of March, first week of March, 7th through 9th. The final will be on June 4th, the second leg of that one. Austin got Violeta AC out of Haiti. Uh, LAFC got Alhuense out of Costa Rica. That's a good matchup in the first round. Orlando City got Tigres. Uh-oh. Tough Ooh. one for them. Better rebuild quick. The Union got Alianza. There's a classic CCL match for you. And the Whitecaps got Real España out of Honduras. Uh, the Mexican teams are sort of all grouped on, if you're looking at the picture of the bracket, uh, mostly grouped on the left side of that bracket. And it is just, I believe, Atlas on the yeah. side of the bracket that has Philly, LAFC, and Vancouver. So think, uh, who has the best Who has the best chance to get to the final? I would say, I know that's in Seattle won, so we're no longer MLS for CCL. But in that mindset, you still this are. is just a good draw. Because <laughs> as you said, I think Philly and LAFC are the two clear favorites out of MLS. Them both being away from a Tigres and Pachuca. And unfortunately, if you need a sacrificial lamb from an <laughs> external point of view, you're going to pick Orlando because what is Orlando? Uh, yeah, so yes, come right over here to this, this stone. Yeah. Nothing is going to happen so, over geez. here. I think so, top of this pyramid. From an MLS point of view, this is a, a really good draw. And then obviously you have to lean on Philly. Um, being the favorites at last we, we don't know what they'll be by the time you get there like this year was such a far drop off for this season from the year previous they have no history of success can they continue it uh where lafc has a tough first round draw um and then so i think philly has sort of the cleanest path to the final could get lafc philly in the uh in the semifinal on be one fun. side of the bracket that could be an interesting mls cup rematch uh, all right, uh, Ben Olsen was unveiled as the manager of the Houston Dynamo. That's uh, some other news we should get in here. Pat Onstad said they were looking for a couple things, first division experience, MLS experience, and someone who's either gotten to the playoffs before or done that before in a similar uh, league or level. Obviously, Ben has has done that before. Uh, Pat said that the Dynamo need more fight, bite, and a return to the attitude of the old Dynamo vibes. They're going to be high pressing on the front foot, he says, two eights, quote unquote, a proactive style. So no low block, no playing exclusively in transition. They came out looking for that. Now, Ben Olsen's team in D.C. were definitively a mid block. I do not remember them as a high pressing team. So that might be a little bit of a change for Ben. Uh, they are tough on cap space. Did he Hopefully say high they- pressing? 
He said high pressing. And he what said coach the term what, high pressing? He did say the in term Houston, high pressing Texas? in Houston, what Texas. What coach in their introductory press conference is going to be like, honestly, we're just going to be playing for draws here. Probably <laughs> DP did what play against. Like, you know what I mean? We'll see what happens when, when they're on the field. Uh, Glenn Davis is reporting that sources say that Albert Elise wants to come back to MLS. Uh, Unfortunately for Houston, they do not have any DP spots open or that I believe that they could open. He was a um, beast. They need yeah. allocation money, but they, they might be able to, but it's their cap situation isn't great. Uh, and then uh, Pat said they're going to sign at least one, hopefully two U22 players. That's like where they can co- sort of get around their cap issues. Probably from South America. In that category. Mateo Bahamic just got option decline. Tiago Inho. Or Tiago, he uh, his didn't they contract... pay a didn't they pay a fee for Bajamish? Yeah, and it, like I think Wasn't it was like one point seven. Group, though? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that yeah, was the last owner. Tiago yeah, was, was, last was in this group. Yeah, so, but I'm just saying historically, Houston have, have not, not yeah, done great. Been bad. Yeah, they got some work to do. They got some work to do. So uh, Ben Olsen's taking that job on. But if you look at Inter Miami, Phil Neville made the playoffs, and uh, Charlie says Ben Olsen and Phil Neville are similar managers, so that's hopeful. Ding ding ding! We ready to do this? We gonna do this? Phil Neville, one year deal. Non plus. Charlie checks out. End of his mind's in Disney. All right. That's it for us. Uh, <laughs> it's the offseason, man. Hit us up. We are willing to talk about literally any MLS rumor you've got. It could be a report. It could be a rumor. It could be something you pulled straight out of you know where. We as long are as there's a blue check mark next to it. We'll yeah, talk about just it. Make sure there's a blue check mark. <laughs> and if, don't tell us if you paid for it. We'd appreciate that. All right. Expansion draft on Friday. We will see you on Monday. We're out of here. Adios. <laughs>